Matthew 26, we come to verses 36 through 46. We'll read it, and then we'll see uh, what the Lord has for us verse by verse. It says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed saying, Oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. As we mentioned it last week, as we come to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we continue to climb up on holier and holier and holier ground. We witness Jesus with his last Passover with the disciples. There he institutes the Lord's Supper. He institutes communion. We take of communion the first Wednesday night of each month. Then after that service, they worship together. And then it tells us they walk down the valley and then up to the Mount of Olives and he comes to a place here in verse 36 called Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane means the olive oil press and all over the Mount of Olives it's covered with olive trees. It's covered with olives, not just random olives there, but there's olive trees there. And here on this mountain there would be many olive groves where they would have olive oil presses. Some commentators think this was a private olive grove and its owner made it readily available for Jesus and his disciples to go there and pray. At an olive oil press, olives would be crushed by an enormous rolling stone that would smash the fruit to a pulp until someone would separate the pits from the valuable oil. At the cross and the events leading up to it, we see the physical pain that Jesus went through, pierced, beaten beyond human recognition by the Pharisees, by the Roman soldiers, the crown of thorns, whipped 39 times, beaten beyond human recognition. We know the social scorn that Jesus went through, spat upon, mocked, a bag put over his head, beaten again. We know the shame that Jesus went through, being hung naked on a cross for everyone to see, beaten beyond human recognition. But here at the Garden of Gethsemane, it's such a holy part of Scripture because we get a small view into the spiritual turmoil that Jesus went through for our sins. It's one thing to be physically broken or emotionally broken, but when our very spirit is hurt and in turmoil, how it affects every part of our life. It tells us that he took all the disciples and he says to them, there's 11, Judas, he's already left to go betray him. He tells the 11, sit here while I go and pray over there. Then in verse 37 and 38, now he takes Peter, James, and John. He takes his closest three disciples with him a little bit further into the garden. And it tells us he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he says to them, he's honest with Peter, James, and John. And he tells them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. 
sorrowful, deeply distressed, a soul that is to the point of even death, speaks of an extremely heavy or burdened soul, grieving and being sad. It speaks of a restlessness that results from a time of deep turmoil, of great trauma and pain. If you've ever attended a funeral, there's this weight at a funeral. There's this burden at a funeral, and depending if it was a child, depending how it happened, depending how much you love them, there's this greater burden and heaviness where there's just silence, there's nothing to be said at a time like this. And a great question to ask is, what brought about these great and deep emotions out of God our Savior? What brought out these great emotions out of God who put on human flesh and dwelt among us? Was it the betrayal of Judas? Was it the abandonment of the other disciples? Was it the 39 lashings from the Romans? Was it the beatings? Was it the cross? What was it? I think we, can, we should turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul gives us insight into what I believed caused our Lord and Savior such exceeding sorrow and how deeply distressed he was. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it tells us, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He knew no sin. He was absolutely perfect. I mentioned this in the first service. Each and every one of us, some of you guys are still in your academic season in life. There are some of us that we got A's and B's. We were average C students. Some of us D's and F's. We got that GED or we barely graduated. School system just kept pushing us ahead. But there are some that know nothing except A's. That's all they get. And then they get their first A minus and it's, oh, right? And they think they have to ask for forgiveness from Jesus Christ because they got a 90 and instead of their normal A's or A pluses. Imagine that person getting an F for the first time. It's questioning everything. You see, far greater than academics, Jesus knew not one sin. Not one lie, not one going over the speed limit, nothing. And now he put on all of our sins. He became our very sins. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it tells us, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live to righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Again, Jesus, the perfect one, became our very sin. He bore our sins, and not our sins only, all the sins of Calvary Chapel, Miami. Not just the sins of Calvary Chapel, Miami, but the sins of the whole world, the sins of the entire human race for every generation and every human being from Adam to the last person that's born. All of the grief, all of the shame and the heaviness that each and every one of us wear and bear because of our sins. He took all of it at once. He became those very sins and not ours only, but all the sins of humanity at the very same time. We bear weight and grief and shame and heaviness when we sin. The first time a kid lies to his parents and they're caught, there's this burden, there's this grief and shame. When we have hidden sin, there's this burden, this grief and shame and heaviness that we wear. And Christ took all of that upon himself. But it's not just my weight and the weight of my sins, but he also took on the grief and the weight, the shame, the heaviness of every abortion ever committed of every abortion doctor, of every adulterer, of every deception, of every genocide. 
of every lie ever committed, of every murder ever committed, of every pedophile, of every organ harvester, of every rapist, of every sex trafficker, Christ put all of these sins upon himself at the very same time. And if our grief drives us mad at times, imagine all of the grief ever committed on this planet being born upon a man at the very same time. He bore the sins of the world in order to be the perfect and the only payment for our sins. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He himself is the propitiation. He is the payment, the ransom for our sins. And not ours only, but also for the whole world. Let's turn to Isaiah 53. And here in Isaiah, even within the Old Testament, if you have someone who's in Judaism and they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, Isaiah 53 is a great place to take them. Who's Isaiah talking about here? Isaiah 53, we'll read verse 2. It tells us, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. I love coming to portions of scripture like this and make it personal. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement for my peace was upon him, and by his stripes I am healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, it could only take a perfect being who was fully God and fully man to take on the full wrath of God for all of mankind. It's the only way that this could happen. And because he bore the iniquity of us all, not only would he be abandoned by Judas, not only would he be abandoned by the disciples and by Peter, James, and John, but for the first time ever, he would be abandoned by the Godhead, even God the Father. We know on the cross that Jesus declares, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting back to Psalm 22, or Psalm 22 is quoting him in the future, rather. And in Psalm 22, verse 1, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? You see, the reason why God the Father did not step in to save his son is to save you and me. We mention this every once in a while. What depth of love would someone have to have for you to allow their son to go through so much pain and torture and torment, even though they have all the power to stop it? It's not as if God the Father was helpless. Not even God the Son was helpless. But as Jesus is going through all this pain and torture and torment, God the Father holds back his hand from saving his son to save you and to save me. What depth of love do I have to have for you to allow one of my sons to be beaten beyond human recognition, to be tried falsely, to be whipped, to be bruised, to be crucified and put to death, even though I have all the power to stop it? What depth of love do I have to have for you? I have three sons. I wouldn't give up one of them for any of you guys. I'll be honest with you. (laughs) What depth of love does God the Father have for you and me? 
that he would not stop all the pain and the torment and the torture that his son went through to save you. To sit back and think of that. It reminds me of a hymn. We sung it. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and I see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. You see, Christ went through all of this pain and torture and being forsaken by God the Father to take on the wrath that I deserve. So that if I by faith accept his death and his sacrifice and his penalty for my sins, we can be saved. We can have access to the Father. And in view of the weight of all this distress and turmoil and heaviness and burdens, we see Jesus asking for help. He simply reaches out and he asks for help. What does he ask his disciples there in Matthew 26? He asks his disciples to stay here and watch with me. Jesus the perfect one, asks his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, he asks the inner circle for their companionship and for their help in time of need. Peter, James, and John, they were a part of the inner circle. It was only these three men who saw Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. It was only these three men who saw Moses face to face, they saw Elijah face to face, and they saw Jesus, only these three men saw Jesus in his true glory at the Mount of Transfiguration. And now he asked them, would you stay here and watch with me? Notice the contrast between Jesus asking for help and Peter earlier the same evening. Jesus warned Peter, hey Pete, you're going to deny me three times. And yet what does Peter say? Lord, help me. Lord, strengthen me. Lord, warn me. No. Peter says, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And then it's not only Peter, but all the disciples said this. We looked at these scriptures last week in Proverbs 18, verse 12. It warns us, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty. That, that man's heart, it's exalted, it's lifted up, and that's what happens before destruction. But before honor is humility. Proverbs 29, verse 23, a man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. A man's pride brings him low, it leads to destruction. But the man who's humble, the man who is showing humility... They're going to have honor and they're going to retain it. After this night, there's only one person that comes out victorious. And it's Jesus. All the disciples, they run for their lives. They're hiding. There's only one man that's not brought low. And it is the man that is the most humble out of the bunch. And it is the only man who's the perfect one out of the bunch. Jesus knew that he would be betrayed that night. So he asks his three closest friends to be vigilant, to be on high alert. To stand guard and to stand watch as he prays. Certainly they could do it, right? Certainly Peter and all of these men said that they were willing to die at his side just hours earlier. Certainly they could do it. And a great question for us to ask ourselves, your family, and if you're not saved, even a great question for you to ask yourself, how often do you look for human support? How often do you go out and ask for companionship? How often do we go out and ask someone else to stand guard watching your back? First responders, they, right, they say, you got my six? Do you, you got my back? Are you watching behind me? How often do we ask others for help? Do we think we can do this all alone? Satan our adversary, the roaring lion, is constantly ro walking around seeking who he can devour. Do you and I think we can do this all alone? Know that if you are saying, hey, I can do this alone. I know Jesus asked for help, but hey, I got this. Know that you're choosing to not learn from the word of God. 
Know that you're choosing to make yourself an easier target for your enemy and adversary, Satan. And he's taken down a lot of people that are far stronger and holier than you or I. A man's pride will bring him low. Before destruction, the, man of, the heart of a man is haughty. The humble in spirit will retain honor, and before honor is humility. If this isn't a case study for us to ask for help, I don't know what is. But so many believers, they want to do this alone. Don't find that in Scripture. Jesus would send them two by two. Even Paul, he would have Barnabas, he would have Titus, he'd have Timothy, he would have men around him. We need to ask for help. And if Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect one, asked for help and sought companionship and the guard of these deeply flawed men, it's not as if these men were perfect. Earlier they were arguing who is the best amongst them. And yet Jesus still asked them for help. How much more should we be asking others to help us, to pray for us? To watch our back, to help us with our blind spots. And not only should we be asking for help, we should be seeking to be a help to others. Not just giving our condolences, not just giving our sympathy, but truly being a companion to those going through deeply distressing and sorrowful seasons of life. Are you going at it alone? Hey, it's just me and my spouse. If Jesus asked for three people's help, we can at least ask for three people's help. We need one another. This is why he's given us the family of Christ. In Proverbs 17, 17, it tells us, A friend loves at all times, and a brother or a sister is born for adversity. Men, you need to be seeking other men for help. Ladies, you need to be seeking other ladies for help. And we need to seek to be a help to others. As we looked at it with Judas, sometimes somebody hurts us. We ask them to be our confidant. And like Jesus, Judas stuck, sticks the knife in our back. And then we just say, I'm never going to get hurt again. We looked at that last week. Our heart will grow cold. It will grow callous. And we will be incapable of loving again, much less loving like Christ. We need one another. We need to be honest with one another. Whatever you're going through, somebody else is going through the same thing. You're not the only one going through whatever season of life or trial or temptation you're in. Then in verse 39, it tells us that he went a little farther. In Luke 22, verse 41, it says about a stone's throw. I don't know how far you could throw a rock, but that's how far Jesus walked, right? He goes a little bit further. Then it tells us he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. No doubt we saw Jesus asking for the help of and companionship of the inner circle, but he didn't stop there. He didn't put all the responsibility on them. He asked them for help, but now he goes to spiritual work, and now he goes out further. He presses in deeper to the Father, and he begins to pray. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, the author of Hebrews gives us some insight into what was Jesus' prayer like here, this stone's throw away from the inner circle of the three disciples. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus didn't just pray here in silence, but he was weeping, vehement cries. He, he couldn't control himself, shaking, weeping, boogers, snot. This is the prayer life of Christ at this moment. And in this time, what's his prayer? Oh, my Father, if it is possible. Father, is this possible? We know with God all things are possible, but there are certain things within his will that he's not going to violate. 
And we know he asked the Father if it's possible. We know that Jesus goes through with this plan. We know that he pleaded with the Father three times if there's any other way. But yet he still goes through the plan. It's a mockery whenever somebody says, is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Absolutely, because if there was any other way, God the Father would have gone with that plan. If there was any other way, if it was our own good works, if it was tithing enough, or going to church a certain amount, or being better than the person next to us, God would have gone down that plan. But this is the only way that man can be saved. This is the only way that we can be saved from our sin and our flesh and from our adversary, the devil. In John John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way. That declaration, he says, I am the way. There's no other way. I am the truth. There is no other truth. I am the life. There is no other life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's our only option. You don't want to go to hell for all of eternity? Jesus is the only option. You want freedom over your sin and over your addictions? Jesus is the only option. He prays, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What was this cup? I believe the Old Testament reveals to us that this is the cup of God's wrath. The cup of God's fury. It's called the cup of trembling. In Psalm 75 verse 8, it speaks of a cup in the hand of God. In Isaiah 51 verse 17, it tells us that it is the cup in his hand of his fury and the cup of his trembling. And what Jesus went through on the cross is he took the full cup of God's pure wrath and fury upon him. That's what he went through for our sins. For anyone who by faith says, Lord, I accept. I accept what you went through. What your word says, I agree. I believe it. I want to follow it. Save me. Then it's payment in full. But if we think there's any other way that our sins can be paid for or atoned for or washed over, the only other cup available is the cup of his fury and wrath. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 25... Paul paints the Lord's Supper in such a beautiful way. He says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For all of mankind, there's only two cups that we can drink from. It's either the cup of God's fury and wrath, or it's this cup of the New Testament. Where we say, Jesus, thank you. For shedding your blood for me. Lord, thank you for having your body broken and beaten for me. It was my sin that held him there. This is the great gospel that we have here in scripture. Yet Jesus finishes his prayer in a way we should really finish all of our prayers. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he's saying. Jesus didn't focus on his own comfort in his prayer. Jesus didn't focus on his own works. God the Father, look at all I've done for you. You could surely throw me a bone. Jesus didn't even focus on what was fair. None of us in our prayer life can say, God, come on, I'm perfect. I don't deserve this. None of us can say that. Jesus, he could have said that. He doesn't focus on his comfort, his works, or what's fair. The focus of Jesus Christ was the will of God. God, whatever your will is for my life, that's what I want. And family, great things happen when we focus not on our will, but on the will of the Father. And absolutely terrible things happen when we're focused on our own will. If you're in your prayer life, you're basically telling God the Father, it's my way or the highway, it is a bad place to be. But so often in our prayer life, we ask the Lord for something, and if we get a no or even a wait, we stop going to church, we close our Bible, we basically throw our fist up at Him, and we say, how dare you not do my will? Notice in Isaiah 14, this is the fall of Lucifer. 
Notice how many times Satan said, I will, before he was cast out of heaven. Isaiah 14, verse 12, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground. You who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Family, who will we live like? What will our prayer and our conversation to God be like? Will we choose to live like Satan, constantly saying, I will, I will, I will? Or will we be like Christ, saying, Father, this is what I desire, but not my will, yours be done. Father, not as I will, but as you will. D.A. Carson, he states, not your will but mine changed paradise into a desert. It brought man from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane. But now, not my will but yours, it brought anguish to the man who prays it. But it transformed the desert into the kingdom. And it brings man from the Garden of Gethsemane into the gates of glory. Wonderful things happen when we pray, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Two great gardens. It began at the Garden of Eden, and it was settled in the Garden of Gethsemane. One commentator, Rod Mattoon, he gives us these compare and contrasts. The Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Eden, everything was delightful. In the Garden of Gethsemane, everything was dreadful and despicable. In the Garden of Eden, Adam parlayed with Satan. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the last Adam, Jesus, prays with the Father. In the Garden of Eden, Adam disobeyed and he sinned. Within the Garden of Gethsemane, the Savior suffered and obeyed. In the Garden of Eden, Adam is conquered by sin. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus conquered his own will. In the Garden of Eden, Adam took the fruit from Eve's hand. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ took the cup from his father's hand. In the Garden of Eden, God sought for Adam. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, the last Adam sought God his father. In the Garden of Eden, self-indulgence of Adam ruined us. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, the agonies of the second Adam has restored us. In the Garden of Eden, Adam's attitude was, my will be done. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' attitude was, Father, thy will be done. How will we pray? Will we pray like the first Adam or like the last Adam? Then we come to verse 40 of Matthew 26. And then he came. Remember, he's how far away from the three? A stone's throw. Was he praying silently? Was Jesus praying silently? No, vehement cries, weeping, anguish. He's a stone's throw away. And now he comes to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? And would this not add to Jesus' pain and loneliness? It's difficult when we're in pain and when we're lonely. But it's such a blessing when you turn back and you have a friend and they give you that thumbs up. If you have kids and they're in a sporting event or a recital, they'll constantly be looking for their parents. And I give my kids a thumbs up when they make eye contact and it settles them. It puts them at ease. But oh, how terrible it is when we look back for a friend, a confidant, a family member, someone we ask to guard our back, and yet they're all asleep. His closest friends hearing him weeping. The disciples, it wasn't just silent night, holy night. 
There wasn't a white noise machine. No, they heard the cries and the weeping and the sniffles of their Savior a stone's throw away. And this was the music they fell asleep to. It's hard enough when we go through difficulty, but when you turn around and the people who you thought had your back put a knife in it or just leave you alone, does it not add to the pain and torment? If that's you here this morning, know that Christ went through it and then some. However despised and rejected you feel, Christ has gone through it and then some. Cry out to Jesus. Verse 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus seems to pivot a little bit here. At first he asked the disciples to pray and watch, to guard, to watch his back, watch his six. But now, as if he's still talking to Peter, he's telling Pete, Hey Peter, remember what we talked about earlier at dinner? You need to be watching and you need to be praying lest you enter into temptation. Peter, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. He warns Peter to watch and pray. Peter, I warn you, temptation is coming. You will fall three times. Be in prayer. Be watching. And as we learned last week, Peter's great fall, it began not in the garden. It began not warming himself by the enemy's fire or trying to sneak into Caiaphas' house. Peter's great fall began all the way in the upper room. When Peter's pride... And self-confidence rejected Jesus' warning. Jesus warned them, Peter, you're going to deny me. And his pride and self-confidence said, Lord, I'm willing to die with you. I don't know about these 11 losers, but Lord, I'm willing to die with you. Jesus warned Peter, and instead of humbling himself and asking for help, Jesus, what are you talking about? When is it going to happen? Who is it going to be? How can I strengthen myself? Instead of doing that, Peter begins to argue with the very word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. Family, self-confidence and pride, we've been learning about it on Wednesday nights, they lead to destruction. When we trust ourselves, our own confidence, when we're too prideful, our spirit is lifted up, it can only lead to destruction. And we very quickly find ourselves arguing With the very word of God. You have a relationship you're praying about and the person is not saved. And then you find yourself arguing with, don't be unequally yoked with non-believers. Lord, but you, Lord, Lord, you know, Lord, you know. My cousins, aunts, sisters, cousins, nephew, they got married when she wasn't saved. And look, she's saved now. And you begin to argue with the Lord. If you're arguing with scripture, trying to prove your point, you're in a position of self-confidence and pride. And these things, it keeps us from just wisdom. Three things it keeps us from. It keeps us, number one, from listening. Our self-confidence and pride, it keeps us from listening. Husbands, I know we never go through this. Your wife tells you, honey, you haven't worked out in a long time. I don't know if you should go do that turkey bowl event. And you say, honey, I got this. There goes the hamstring, right? You don't listen to her. You talk with a pastor. They warn you. I don't know if that's the wisest thing to do. And you don't listen. It's self-confidence. It's pride that keeps us from listening. Second thing our our pride and self-confidence keep us from doing is it keeps us from preparing. It keeps us from preparing. Instead of the disciples watching and standing guard and doing whatever they could to stay awake and stand guard, knowing that their master told them, I'm going to be betrayed tonight. Instead of watching and standing guard and being perched up in the trees, ready to pounce on whoever the betrayer was, the only thing they were preparing for was to take a nap. When we are prideful, we don't prepare. We don't put on the armor of God. We don't spend the time in the Bible that we should. And finally, what's the last thing that we don't do when we're filled with pride and self-confidence? Is it keeps us from praying. It keeps us from praying. Man, I've gone through harder things than this. This is no big deal. I've had bigger business deals than this. It's no big deal. I've had a tougher test than this. It's no big deal. It's all of our pride and self-confidence. 
We have to believe God's word where Jesus tells us, apart from me, you can do nothing. Warren Wiersbe, great commentator, he tells us, watch and pray is like saying, pray with your eyes open. That's how we should drive in Miami, praying with our eyes open all the time. The familiar phrase, watch and pray, goes back to the days of Nehemiah when he was leading the people in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and restoring the gates. The enemy did not want the holy city to be rebuilt, so the enemy used fear, deceit, and every kind of ruse to hinder God's work. What was Nehemiah's defense? Nehemiah 4.9, nevertheless, we made prayer to our God, and because of them, the enemy, we set a watch against them day and night. Nehemiah tells us that they worked on the wall with a tool in one hand and a sword in another, praying the whole time. Later, Peter, I think Peter, he learned his lesson. And in 1 Peter 4, 7, he commands God's people to be on guard and pray. Watch and pray. Pray with intelligence. Pray with alertness. Family, we are soldiers in a battle, and we dare not go to sleep while we are on duty. And this is our life till we see him face to face. We are in a war. We are in a battle. May we be standing guard. May we be paying attention, knowing our adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion. May we realize our greatest threat is the double agent that lives inside of us. The flesh that rears its ugly head every once in a while. May we stand and watch and pray. Then in verse 42, again a second time he went away and he prayed saying, Oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. So this time, he just leaves them. He went away again, and he prayed the third time, saying the same words. We see Jesus praying the same prayer three times. Lord, if there's any way, let this cup pass. If there's any way, Lord, please, if there's any other way mankind can be saved, let's pick that plan. This was the only way. A great thing we see here is just the importance of private prayer. Do you pray alone? Do you take time and say, Lord, I just got to go up to my room. I got to go to the closet. I just got to go out and just alone lay flat on our faces and pray privately to our Father in heaven, our perfect dad. We get to go to him and ask him. Then verse 45, then he came to his disciples. They're still asleep. He wakes them up and he says, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Again, just how strong our Savior is. Been blessed to be able to go to Israel a few times. And we go to one of the areas, I think maybe the Garden of Gethsemane. Is there on the Mount of Olives? And there's ancient olive trees and olive groves even till this day. On our last trip, uh, me and my wife Amanda, uh, during one of the dinners, we snuck out. And we went to this public park that's there on the Mount of Olives at night. And it's just eerily quiet. It's eerily quiet there. It's, it's a beautiful space, but there at the Mount of Olives, you can see down into the valley, and then you look up and you see the Temple Mount right there. You see the Wailing Wall, you see the Dome of the Rock, and right there, that's where the Temple would have stood. There on the Passover, some commentators say it was a full moon, and perhaps Jesus saw the blood trickling down from the Passover lambs being slaughtered. But no doubt Jesus being up there in the dead of night without any... Light pollution from modern technology, he would have seen the torches. He would have seen the betrayer coming. He would have seen the temple's police force coming to arrest him. He doesn't hide. He doesn't run. He doesn't raise up arms, but he sees them praying the whole time. 
Verse 47, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. And now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. I think this is so interesting because it's telling us the men that were going to arrest Jesus didn't necessarily know what he looked like. They were coming to a group of 12 people, Jesus and 11 disciples, and they couldn't pick him out on on a wall. If you talk with some of our police officers, some of our first responders, they'll tell you they have certain people that frequent their business. People that are constantly getting arrested over and over and over again in the area that they work. They are frequent customers, if you would. And what this tells us is that Jesus wasn't seen as a threat or a problem to the police force of the Temple Mount. This wasn't the Roman guards or soldiers that arrested them. This was the guards of the temple and the high priest and these religious leaders. So these religious leaders, they saw Jesus as a great threat, but Jesus was there every morning as we've been reading the week leading up to his being crucified. And yet none of these officers, oh, Jesus, oh, that problematic guy, I know exactly who you're talking about. Let's go get them. Judas had to give them a sign so they would know who in the world he's talking about. Jesus, he didn't pose a threat to people coming to God or people coming to the temple. Jesus posed a threat to these religious men and their pockets and their power. And it's a warning to us. It's not good enough to be a religious man. It's not good enough to be a religious woman. We see here very evil things being done in secret by so-called religious men. Then he came to his disciples and said, we jump down, sorry, verse 19, and immediately, sorry, verse 48, now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one sees him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him I don't know how our savior had so much self-control to not hit him but here's Judas and he's calling him rabbi teacher and he's kissing him the word here in the Greek for kissed him is not just once right Calvary Chapel Miami we're obedient to scripture we greet one another with a holy kiss you give a little Cuban kiss or Hispanic kiss on the cheek in Middle Eastern cultures, they do something very similar. They kiss on the cheeks. This word kiss, it speaks of smothering with kisses. That Judas stayed there, close to Jesus, intimate with Jesus, and he stuck to him as a sign for these temple guards to arrest him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, friend, why have you come? We see the great love and mercy of Christ. He doesn't say enemy. He doesn't say backstabber. He doesn't say, hey, Lucifer, how are you doing? Friend, why have you come? I do believe Jesus, even in the last moments, he's still trying to reach out and get Judas' attention. Friend, why have you come? Then they they came and they laid hands on Jesus and took him. Other Gospels tell us that at first they asked, who is Jesus? Who is Christ? And Jesus stepped forward and he said, I am. And when Jesus said, I am, it tells us that all of them fell back and were flat on their backs looking up to the sky. If I was on duty that night, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand them a resignation. I'm not going through with this arrest. This guy just said two words and I'm flat on my back. I'm not here for this. But yet they still kept going forward. Verse 51, and suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest. We find out later his name is Malchus and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? There's over 70,000 angels. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must thus happen? Either Peter, where we find out later this is Peter, either Peter's so asleep that he's a pretty good shot 
and he's in a, a sleep and he goes for the head and he just gets Malchus's ear. Or Peter being a fisherman trying to wield a sword. His aim is so bad that he's going for the head and all he gets is an ear. We don't know which one it is. Jesus tells him, Peter, put your sword away. I think Jesus tells him this because how often did Jesus tell his disciples, guys, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed by the religious leaders. I'm going to be tried unfairly, unjustly. I'm going to be crucified. And then three days later, I'm going to rise again. He told the disciples this over and over again. And yet Peter is here trying to stop this from happening. Then he tells Peter, Peter, you're not the one that's going to save me. If I wanted to call down from heaven, if I just say the word, 70,000 angels will come. We know within uh, the lifespan of Elisha, one angel wiped out the entire Assyrian army. What are 70,000 angels capable of? This needed to happen so that scripture would be fulfilled. We know later on that Jesus, he picks up this guy's ear and he heals him. Reason number two to say, I quit. I'm not arresting these guys. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not going through with this. Some commentators, they say, hey, maybe it's true. Jesus saved Peter that night from being the fourth guy crucified in the next morning. Because Peter, if he swung at one of these men and cut off his ear, they could have tried him. But here Jesus, he heals his own enemy. I think this is a great word picture for us. When we're trying to reach out to our enemy, are we swinging the sword, hacking off ears? Right? You, you go to Thanksgiving and you whip out your sword, right? Every man is a sinner. All sinners are going to hell. You're being damned. and right, You're just whipping out your sword. And all you're doing, whipping out all these verses, is you're just cutting off ears left and right. And all you're doing is you're making it incapable for them to hear you and hear the word of God. At the very other end, we see Jesus picking up the ear to heal his own enemy. No doubt we need to use scripture and we need to preach the gospel, but we need to show the love of Christ. It is his kindness that leads us to repentance. And no doubt some of our family members and friends, they don't want to hear it from us because of the lifestyle we live or the morals we stand for or our love for Jesus Christ. But I think there's a lot of family members that can't stand their Christian family because all they do is lop off ears. They're not trying to demonstrate the love of Christ or the kindness of Christ. They're just taking out that sword and they're going at anybody's ear within the room. May we learn not to be like Peter, but to be like Christ. Share the word, share the truth, but show the love of God. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Verse 55, in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples forsook him and fled. I love that Jesus calls out their cowardice. He goes, guys, I was with you every single morning and you didn't come to arrest me then. Why do you come to me in the dead of night with swords and clubs like a robber or a thief to come and seize me? Verse 57, and those who had laid hold of Jesus, they led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. They already had come to the agreement. They already had come to what they were going to bring against him. They were just looking for pieces to make it happen. Now the chief priests, the elders, all the council, they're seeking false testimony to put Jesus to death but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and they said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. 
Scripture tells us, as a lamb before its shears, he stayed silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. One interesting thing here for us is these religious men that were all about their rules, all about the crossing the T's and dotting the I's, the ones that would cough out a gnat, afraid of swallowing it with unclean, with blood, the very men that were weighing out 10% of their spices are violating every single judicial rule in trying Jesus Christ. There is to be no trial at night. There is to be no trial at secret. There is to be no trial during a Sabbath. There is no trial to be had during a feast day. There is no trial and putting someone to death, giving them a death sentence, unless you waited a full night's rest to now put forth and put this accusation and wait upon them. We know that in the Old Testament, it was only on the mouth of two or three witnesses that you could accuse someone. So these quote-unquote righteous men have the worst trial in the history of mankind. It's all a lie, and it's not just one trial, but two and three trials. It's until Jesus is asked, and now he's put under oath by the living God, the high priest, he had this power, and he asked Jesus, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. They're looking for all these accusations, there's none. No one's willing to accuse him or point out one sin in him. Jesus finally stands up and he speaks and he says, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Speaking of his second return. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard this blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face, and they beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? It's as if Jesus said, hey, you're not going to try me and put to death calling me a terrorist. That's not the truth. I'm not here to destroy the temple. If you're going to be put me to death, know that it is because I'm telling you I am the Son of God. If you're going to put me to death, know it is because I am the Messiah. I am the Savior of the world. And then we see how these religious men act. Could you imagine a group of pastors acting like this? Ganging up on a man, spitting in his face, beating him, striking him. Other gospels tell us that they put a bag over his head, striking him, hitting him with blows, telling him to prophesy to him. Once again, family, it's not good enough to just be a righteous person. We need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 69, now Peter sat outside the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. It's a little girl. It's a servant girl. It's not the great executioner of Jerusalem asking him this question, or officer or soldier. It's a servant girl. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you are saying. And when he had gone out of the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. He spoke with that Galilean twang. Verse 74, then he began to curse. He said, uh, basically, to curse and swear, saying, man, I swear to God, I don't know that man. Curse my life. Let me be sent to hell for all of eternity. I don't know that man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus, who said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out. And wept bitterly. One of the other gospels tell us that it's at that third betrayal. Right after it is the very moment that Jesus is coming out of the courtroom to be marched off to the next false trial. And at that moment it tells us that Jesus locked eyes with Peter. Right after he denies him. 
Jesus, he locked eyes with Peter. And I do, I think it was eyes of love, of grace, and mercy. I don't think Jesus was there looking at Peter going, <laughs> all right, you're dead to me or anything like that. I, I think it was eyes of love. Peter, I told you, man. But hey, once you're strengthened, meet me, meet your brothers in Galilee. There's still so much for you to do. One of the great things of Peter, you look at the character arc of Peter after the book of Acts. Peter, he's not just standing up and being bold for Christ in front of a children's ministry, in front of a bunch of little girls. Peter stands up in front of the very Pharisees and Sadducees and high priests that had the power to send Jesus to death and to the cross. Peter stands up in front of these very men and gives them the gospel. And there what it shows us is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's after Pentecost that Peter has this great power and this great boldness. Peter didn't fail for a lack of trying or a lack of strength or will or self-confidence. Peter failed because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's why we need to be connected to Jesus, abiding in Jesus, and just being asked over and over again, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit to overflowing. Lord, apart from you, I can do nothing. So hey, if the worship team will come up, Let's all stand, and we'll close in song. Pastors, if you guys would come up front as well. I would encourage you, if you're going through a distressing and trying time, you're weighed down your burden, come up front. Pray with one of the pastors. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to be there with you and continue praying for you and what you're going through. If perhaps you've been blown away at the love of Christ and everything Jesus went through for us, And for our sins, and you've never prayed that prayer, you've never asked Jesus to be the ruler of your life, I would encourage you, come up front for prayer. Don't forget, after service, got some good chicken bowls. And then tonight at 6 p.m., we have our prayer service and then our water baptism. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you went through all of this pain, all of this torment, all of this torture, Lord, for us Lord, you did it to glorify the Father. You did it to glorify yourself. But Lord, you did all these things because it was the only way to save us. Lord, help us to take advantage of this great offer, Lord. Help us. If any of us don't know you, Lord, if any of us just see ourselves as a religious man or a religious woman, Lord, if any of us are like Peter and we're just following at a great distance, Lord, we're, we're afraid to be identified with you. We're afraid that people would know that we're Christians or afraid of our morals, our stance of who our King and Savior is. Lord, I pray for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, that we'd be bold as lions for your kingdom, declaring you as King and just sharing the gospel and the good news of who you are and what you've done for us. So, Lord, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for going through the garden, of going through the cross, of defeating sin and death and the devil himself for each and every one of us. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.